It's a great privilege to see you again, Maestro. <laughs> My great pleasure. Tilson Thomas. And you're bringing in March next year, 2014, your own orchestra, the San Francisco Symphony, with a very interesting program of American pieces, aside from the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, which we will, of course, look forward to as well. But tell us about these other pieces. The Ives, I imagine, is, 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 is quite a shortish piece. It's from another work, I think. It's a movement from another work, is it? Charles Ives, who's been a great speciality of mine my whole life mm. since I was a youngster, really, I, I do believe he's still probably the monumental American composer in that his works predicted the entire future of the history of American music. Yes. In somewhere in a piece of Charles Ives, you have a moment which is a Copeland moment, a Gershwin moment, a Steve Reich moment, Elliot Carter moment. They're all there, really. <laughs> and at this amazingly short period of time, he was such a visionary, he saw it all, did it all. Yeah. Uh, this particular piece called the Alcants is the third movement of one of his most famous pieces, the Concord Sonata, the piano sonata. Everyone knew, I was included, that the scope of this piece was far beyond that of a piano sonata, but Ives did not have the experience in writing for orchestra as he never heard an orchestral piece of his until, as a very old man, he heard one on the radio conducted by Bernstein. So this was quite beyond him. I, however, a composer named Henry Brandt, who was also an American avant-garde composer a few generations later, undertook the project of orchestrating this piece. And it became a real obsession with him. He spent almost 50 years working on it, trying it and revising it. He did a splendid job. Interestingly, Brandt was himself, uh, in addition to his avant-garde work, a very, very successful Broadway and film orchestrator. So he had this wonderful kind of larger-than-life quality of being able to make something seem expansive and open. And he used exactly those skills on this little Ives piece, which in his hands is filled with great expression and I would just say that when I think of a piece of music that ardently and honestly expresses the very best of what not only American music but the American spirit itself can be, it would be this piece, and which is why I wanted to present it to your public. I don't think we would have heard it over here before. I doubt it very much. I don't think so. Now, John Adams, on the, which is the major work in your, in your program, John Adams is beginning to get acceptance over here in, in, in mainland Europe, as you might say, as well as here. Um, and he is the most interesting composer, isn't he? And this work of his, this new work of his, which you commissioned in San Francisco and first performed a couple of years ago, not his, would it be his first performance in this country? Oh, no, no, no. No, you've done, you've done it yourself? No, oh, I'm sorry, perhaps I misunderstood your question. Would it be the first be the, performance of this British piece? The British premiere. Uh -huh. The British premiere. Well, th that's a very intriguing question, but I don't quite know how to answer it, because it may have been done in another version, oh. an earlier version. The piece has a remarkable history. Yeah. The piece, which is called Absolute Jest, yes. is for a solo string quartet, in this case the amazing St. Lawrence yes. Quartet, yes. and orchestra, and it is John's take, his, his uh, perspective on music of Beethoven, especially the late Beethoven string quartets, has a lot to do with the scherzi, mostly, from the late Beethoven, Beethoven string quartets. What is interesting is he wrote this piece, which is 25 minutes long or so, and we premiered it, and then he thought about it. I think he may have done it over here in that form. And he's taken it back and he composed an entirely different first part of the piece. The first four, five hundred bars are different. And it has made a transformative difference in the nature of the piece. The piece in its first version was absolutely brilliant and quirky and full of wonderfully arcane little observations and witty 
perspectives on Beethoven. In this new version, I would say it's an enormously moving piece because it starts more from John's perspective as a composer with all the great spaciousness of his music. And then from that, it begins to remember Beethoven and explore its inner world and ultimately really uh, bring a very inspiring, triumphant new vision of the music to us. I, I think it's one of his more profound pieces of recent years. Is it easy to recognize the Beethoven references? Very it? easy. Is it? Very easy. If you know your quartets, if you know yes. the Fourth Symphony, if you know the Ninth Symphony, mm -hmm. you'll have no trouble. It doesn't have ya da 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 dee da da. It doesn't have Freude schöne Goethe Punken in it, but yeah. it has things you will remember <laughs> and notice. And you played this piece often in, in America? Or? It's become quite a hit. People really, like it. That's excellent, isn't it? Because that's what we need with, with so called modern music, isn't it? Yes, well, and of course, it's unusual, a piece for string quartet and orchestra. There's mm -hmm. the Spur and Gesangsehne, and there's some unusual pieces by Morton Feldman, but it's not exactly the most common medium. And to have a group like the St. Lawrence Quartet, which I would say is one of the most uh, wonderfully intrepid uh, quartets out there. They really go for it, as we would say in America. Mm -hmm. And to have them uh, presenting this music, which is a mixture of both of Beethoven's most amazing thoughts and John's symphonic perspectives is, yes. is really a tour de force. You said, if you know your late Beethoven quartets, does one ever know one's Beethoven late, late quartets really thoroughly? Well, I've tried it's a, for 50, it's for a 50 life, years. lifetime study. I wondered if he, when, when I read uh, what he said about the medium the, the, that he had chosen, the string quartet and the orchestra, um, he says, is there any other piece similarly scored? Whether you would know Elgar's introduction on Allegro, of yes, course, of course. which is a hugely successful, but possibly only over here. No, people know. Of course, it's it's known. Yes, but not by him. Well, we should look forward to that immensely because I mean, it's you know it's, nowadays with things being quite difficult in getting orchestras, I and mean, very few American orchestras are touring now in in Europe. Um, so we're not getting the American pieces that we used to get. Not even Billy the Kid and Appalachian Spring and, and so on, which, which you done with, which you did when you were here last time. So it's very interesting. The Symphony Fantastique, have you anything to add about that? Well, this is a piece that uh, is in my bones, so to speak. Oh. Uh, I think my approach to it is, again, very coloristic, very gestural. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so interesting that the piece contains so many eccentricities uh, which are quite specific to the actual way in which the phrases are indicated by Berlioz. And I had a lovely experience, which was a real insight into that. that I was uh, in the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in uh, Paris, and I was allowed to examine for a day the original score of the piece. And it's amazing because Berlioz quite clearly had this one score he used his whole career. And it's a palimpsest. It's many, many layers pasted one over the other and corrected and altered in various colors of ink because he just kept in his own quirky way hearing it and changing it and making it more remarkable. But what's really kind of lovely is that uh, the, uh, the glue for that manuscript being from that of the 1830s and 40s has gotten quite dry. Yes, yeah. And so a lot of it is kind of coming apart. It's still in the right place, yeah. but you can kind of look under and behind and around the uh, various emendations and you can see what it originally was and what yes. he ultimately did with it. And that, and that is illuminating. And that's a symphony which is also in your orchestra's bones, isn't it? Going back to Monteur's day. Absolutely, and of course from my years with the Boston Symphony Orchestra where both yeah. Monta and, and yeah, Munch were there, so yeah. I, the performances are quite different yes. from night to night, and I that, think that's the way it that's needs right. to be. That's right. Well, thank you very much for giving us your time. We so look forward to your concert in March with your own orchestra here in Symphony Hall. Thank you so well, much. Well, thank you so much. I can tell you the whole San Francisco Symphony, which is an orchestra which plays an incredible heart and color, and they couldn't be happier 
and knowing that they're going to be coming to play in your wonderful home.